Comiskey Park, a citadel of entertainment and hope, has been a Chicago landmark since 1910. The White Sox, a Chicago heritage since 1901. Here, 10 million fans have enjoyed Major League Baseball during the last eight years. While they thrill to the action on the field, hundreds of youngsters envision the day they'll be playing for the White Sox, responding to the thunderous ovations of the crowd. This is America, and our national pastime, baseball. And this is where the White Sox story begins. To the fans, the ball game is nine innings on the field and the final outcome. Few realize the planning, thought, and work behind the team on the field. The White Sox organization, guided by Charles A. Comiskey II and his co-vice president, John D. Rigney, is constantly in search of means to improve the club. Today with experienced talent, tomorrow and next year with new blood. The Comiskey dynasty began with the old Roman and has since gone from father to son to daughter-in-law and now to the granddaughter and his name-bearing grandson. Club officials are constantly in touch with all facets of Major League affairs and are especially close to the farm system, the heart of a Major League club. Farm director Glenn Miller informs his assistant, Jack Sheehan, of the signing of a new prospect. Through the medium of the telephone, Miller is in constant touch with the more than 30 scouts who comb every corner of the country. He checks scouts' reports on an outstanding prospect from the West Coast who's been under surveillance for the past three years and is now eligible to sign. With complete information available, he approaches Comiskey's office. The final decision is now up to the top brass. Comiskey and Rigney have been apprised of the youngster's progress week by week over the last three years, and now comes the moment of decision. What will it take to sign him? What class of ball can he play? Let's take him to Tampa with the parent club next spring and get a look at him. Who is this prospect that's excited the front office? Let's go to California for a scene that's been enacted many times during the past three years. Young Johnny Callison is a standout in everything, but the scout must determine if he is so outstanding because he's head and shoulders above his present competition, which could be lacking in talent, or if he really is a diamond in the rough. White Sox scouts Doc Bennett and Hollis Thurston continue to watch and catalog every action of young Johnny. If they needed a convincer, Johnny provides it with a tremendous home run over the right field fence. over, it's time to approach the young Phenom. Now that his high school eligibility has ended, it's time to talk about a future in organized baseball. Sold on the merits of the White Sox organization, Johnny is a willing listener to Thurston and Bennett. His opportunities to advance in the White Sox system have been outlined to him. Contract terms are agreeable. Here's the pen. The name goes on the dotted line. Contract signed, spring training opens. It's time for Johnny to bid farewell to his family and head across country. First stop, the nearest airline office. This is it, the industrial center of Florida's west coast, Tampa. The club's headquarters is the famed Tampa Terrace Hotel. Breakfast in the Terrace Room is Johnny's introduction to Southern hospitality as he finds himself surrounded by Major League players and coaches. Time to go to work. Johnny and other White Sox players leave the hotel for their chartered bus and the opening of spring training at Al Lopez Field. Flo 
Florida's newest and finest stadium, Al Lopez Field, is the scene of White Sox activities for the next six weeks. Making his first official appearance in a White Sox uniform, it is a proud youngster who approaches manager Al Lopez and such outstanding White Sox stars as Nelson Fox and Billy Pierce. These are names he's read about and revered. Now, he's their teammate. First order of business is the daily batting practice. Now it's Johnny's turn to show what he can do with the bat. He takes his place in the batter's cage and takes his swings. Impressive with his stick work, Johnny gets an assignment in the outfield in the first exhibition game. Taking in every move on the field is Vice President John D. Rigney and his wife, Dorothy, Secretary Treasurer of the White Sox. Play ball! Johnny didn't have to wait long for his first chance, coming in to take a short fly ball. He's got it. Also observing his charges in action is Vice President Charles A. Comiskey. Now Johnny has his first chance at the plate. Looks one over. After looking one over, he lines a double to right center. Johnny rounds third and races across the plate with the first White Sox run. Weeks later, his observation by White Sox Major League officials completed, Johnny heads for the Sox Minor League headquarters in Hollywood, Florida with excellent recommendations. He leads a group of hopefuls as they head into three more weeks of training. The first stop is the Midtown Motel, headquarters for the Indianapolis, Colorado Springs, Davenport, Duluth Superior, and Dubuque Farm Clubs. The Holdridge Club in the Nebraska State Rookie League does not open until June, and spring training for this club is held in Holdridge. As the players check in with Farm Secretary Carol Davis, they're assigned to rooms and informed of training camp regulations. Next morning, work starts in earnest. All players report to Dowdy Field. After preliminary instructions by Hugh Mulcahy, Walker Cooper, Johnny Hutchings, Benny Huffman, John Mostel, and Frank Peretti, the camp instructors, the first order of business is to get the legs in shape and they're off on the first of many romps around the field. Now comes the first of many specific instructions. Pitching coach Hugh Mulcahy advises hurlers to get comfortable on the mound. To stride naturally and smoothly. He cautions pitchers not to land on their heel and break the rhythm of their motion. Now he warns pitchers about stepping toward third base. Right-handers, that is as it forces them to pitch across their body and deprives them of coordination and leverage. He shows first the wrong and then the right way to hide pitches. The glove can be a deceptive weapon for pitchers and should be used to hide the grip on the ball. All 
All base runners are in for a series of sessions in the sliding pit with ex-major leaguer Donnie Mostel. Here he begins his instructions with a demonstration of the proper sliding technique. Mostel emphasizes keeping the hands over the head to avoid injuries to the hands and wrists. Mostel points out the necessity of keeping the left foot above ground so the spikes will not catch and also checks the position of the right foot to see that the player hooks the base to slide away from the tag and doesn't put the leg under unnecessary strain by hitting the base with a full impact. The catchers come in for their share of individual instructions too. Former Major League receiver Walker Cooper begins their tutoring with instructions on position and balance. Then some words on the best method to handle low pitches, pointing out the advantage of having the glove under and not over the ball on low pitches. Of utmost importance to the catcher is the protection of his throwing hand. By closing the hand and pressing the thumb on top of the fingers, the area vulnerable to foul balls is greatly reduced. The young backstops eager to learn devote their undivided attention to Cooper's instructions. It is important that signs are hidden from enemy coaches, base runners, and bench. Hand signals are given behind the cover of the right knee on the first base side, and the glove shields them from the prying eyes of the third base coach. Mostel demonstrates outfield technique. With arms at the side and weight evenly distributed, an outfielder can break forward, backward, or to either side the fraction of a second it takes to determine the trajectory of the ball. Batting styles vary with the individual hitter, but certain procedures are standard with all good hitters. After watching a few preliminary swings by Johnny, Cooper cautions him to keep his shoulders level, not to dip his front shoulder as he swings. Also to keep his head level and not to pull up on the swing. Next comes the rotation of the hips. They flow on a level plane and help give maximum power to every swing. Now it's time to try the technique against Iron Mike. The day's work completed, the players sit down to a hearty dinner at the club's plush headwaters. After dinner comes time for relaxation under balmy Florida skies. What'll it be? A game of hearts? Anyone for shuffleboard? Or just loaf around the swimming pool observing the beauties of Florida. Sorry, boys, don't go near the water. It's off limits, as swimming tends to stretch the arm and leg muscles, and that's detrimental to a baseball player's physical makeup. Managers and coaches' reports are made nightly in an evaluating program that outlines the abilities, potentials, and weaknesses of the players. They're discussed with farm director Miller as he takes the reports of his aides in making a final determination of what classification is right for each player. It's Indianapolis, the capital city of the Hoosier State for Johnny, a shot at Triple-A competition, just one step removed from the major leagues. Victory Field will be his proving ground for the next five months. He tries on the Indianapolis uniform for the first time. <laughs> and makes the first catch of the season. It's game time as Johnny and his mates take to the field before the watchful eyes of the Indianapolis gathering. From his vantage point in center field, Johnny awaits his first chance. Here it comes. And here's another. No, the second baseman makes a sensational diving catch. That's it, Johnny. Teamwork, helping one another for the benefit of everyone.
it's your turn to bat. Remember those principles you've been practicing all spring. Get your sign from the coach at third base. This one looks good. It's going to be a single. Hold up at first. Now let's try our speed. Another lesson is learned. Study the pitcher's motion and know when to go down. Meanwhile, back in Chicago, business goes on as usual. There's no waiting for the Johnnies, but there will always be room for the good ones when they're ready. Comiskey Park looks like a sleeping city on the morning of a big game, but the first of an army of more than 500 workers is already beginning his work day. The tarp has been removed, and the ground crew is working over the infield. The batting cage is moved into position for pre-game batting practice. The janitors are early arrivals too as they remove the debris from yesterday's game and spruce up the park to add to the comfort and convenience of the fans. Spectators' thirsts and appetites are not overlooked as the commissary stocks up for the forthcoming battle. Here in the public relations office, the liaison work between the club and the press, television and radio is accomplished. Director Ed Short maintains individual and team statistical reports for the manager and front office to enable them to make immediate evaluations of their own players and those with other clubs. As game time draws near, the parking facilities for more than 5,000 begin to fill up. The sleeping city is now aroused and transformed into a center of hustling activity. A full complement of ticket sellers speed customers into the park in their choice seat locations. As the ground crew completes its manicure of the infield, the tension mounts. The rival pitchers get in their final warm-up tosses. Newspaper reporters are poised for action. A full crew of photographers is ready to transmit action pictures across the nation. And television and radio announcers are ready to send visual and word pictures to millions of viewers and listeners. The managers submit their lineups to the umpires. His season at Indianapolis at an end, Johnny has been invited to stop over in Chicago en route to California. Sitting with Vice President Comiskey, he watches the White Sox charge onto the field. Johnny watches every move of his future teammates and lets his imagination carry him away as he dreams of the day he'll be playing for the White Sox. This he envisions as his big chance. How will he react in the outfield? Will he be nervous playing before a packed house? A dramatic situation, bases loaded, two out, the Sox trailing by two runs. Is it a base hit? No, Johnny charges in and makes a great catch to keep the White Sox within striking distance of the enemy. A base hit there would have broken the game wide open. Now it's the White Sox turn. Jim Landis tries to get a rally started. He gets his side from the third base coach. Takes ball four. This can be the start of it. A moment later, the batter catches the infield napping and drags one down the first baseline, and Landis is safe at second. line and the score is tied as the hitter slides head first into third base with the potential lead run. This is Johnny's chance to be a hero.
Here's the windup. And the pitch. And there it goes. Johnny slices one past the third baseman, and the lead run streaks across the plate as Johnny dives into second base with a double. The crowd gives Johnny a rousing ovation. Yes, this is Johnny's dream. A dream, in fact, that can come true for any American boy who has the baseball ability and determination. This is the White Sox story. Thank <laughs> you.